In this lesson, we're going to be talking about low back pain and the vast differential that should come into your brain whenever you see a practice question or a test question where one of the symptoms is low back pain. Now, I think it's prudent to sort of set the stage and explain first why low back pain is such a high yield topic on Comlex. In pursuit of the sort of holistic osteopathic mission, a lot of Comlex will turn its attention to topics, especially in the OMT subsection where they'll give you those OMM questions on issues that are public health concerns. And low back pain is a top 10 cause of disability adjusted life years, or you might see that written as DALYs, D-A-L-Y, um, worldwide. The estimated prevalence, lifetime prevalence of low back pain is 60 to 70%. So this really does affect almost everybody. Low back pain is the number one cause of work and activity limitation, and it has unfortunately contributed to the growing opioid epidemic in the sense that some clinicians have chosen to just prescribe these heavy-duty painkillers to try to get rid of chronic low back pain. Now, it's because of all of these reasons collectively that low back pain is a public health concern. It's very common. And again, because OMM really focuses on holistic approaches to medicine, since low back pain can be treated with OMT, this is an incredibly high yield topic on Comlex. So in today's video, what we're going to do is go through a couple things. First, we'll start with the, quote, osteopathic low back pain pathology. And to be honest, these are not terms that are unique to just osteopathic physicians, but they do tend to be incredibly high yield for complex and in class exams. So we'll talk about them first. They're often confused with one another because, as you can see, they all begin with spondylo right? Spondylosis, spondylolisthesis, and spondylolysis. So we're going to differentiate and talk about those three conditions first. And then in the second half of the video, we'll talk about the other conditions you see on the slide here, which are perhaps the more practical differential pathologies in the low back area that you want to keep in your mind whenever you see a question that involves low back pain. So let's begin by differentiating those three terms up top, spondylolysis, spondylosis, and spondylolisthesis. These, again, are very high yield on complex. So we'll start with spondylosis. Spondylosis refers to degenerative spine, usually caused by age-related or use-related, quote, wear and tear. In spondylosis, you're going to have findings such as osteophytes, which are bony projections that will come off of the spine. Disc space narrowing, so those intervertebral discs will be so damaged and so inflamed due to this wear and tear that they'll narrow a bit, which could cause adjacent vertebrae to shear on one another, causing more pain and more osteophyte formation. Other findings are pain with motion or movement that will get better at rest. So classically, these patients don't really want to ambulate too much because those degenerated vertebrae with those little bony projections and narrow intervertebral discs that can't quite absorb all of the force directed through the spine, they'll rub against one another when the person moves. So because of this, they just kind of want to lay on their couch. Risk factors are what you might imagine. So anybody who is overweight or has some risk for overuse, such as manual laborers, etc., they'll all be more likely to have a degenerative spine, which will cause that wear and tear. So what we're talking about here is let's say that you have a normal spine, which is shown on the left side of the slide. What spondylosis might look like is what you see on the right side of the slide. So a couple things to point out. First, in blue, you see the osteophyte formation. So these are the little bony projections that form off of the vertebrae. In red, you see that intervertebral disc, which previously was bulky and healthy on the left side of the slide, but has narrowed over time due to a lot of wear and tear being directed through that intervertebral disc. And as this happens, as you get bony outgrowth and disc space narrowing, the vertebrae themselves will degenerate somewhat because they're shearing on one another and rubbing with excessive force on one another. And that's spondylosis. Next, we're going to talk about spondylolisthesis. Spondylolisthesis, what is that? Spondylolisthesis refers to anterior slippage of one vertebrae relative to the one beneath it. So again, if we go back to our normal spine, which you see here on the left part of this slide, spondylolisthesis happens when you get anterior slippage. So if one vertebrae slips forward, which is depicted by those red arrows, you get spondylolisthesis. 
Now, how do we diagnose this? Well, spondylolisthesis is diagnosed with a lateral x-ray. And as you can see in this image, if you looked anterior or posterior, you might not be able to detect the anterior slippage because it would be occurring in the same plane of your vision. And because of that, you'd have to look laterally. Now, this may demonstrate the step-off point, which you can see visually from radiographic imaging, or if you are a gifted physician with the ability to palpate very deeply into the back, you may actually be able to palpate this step off. So as you run your hand down the, slot, down the spine, because there's anterior slippage, you might feel that slight step off or that give during palpation. That's spondylolisthesis, nothing major to know, just know the definition of anterior slippage and know that it's diagnosed with the lateral x-ray. The last of the three terms that sound somewhat interchangeable is spondylolysis. Spondylolysis refers to a fracture in the pars interarticularis in one of the vertebrae. Now, high yield, this is diagnosed with an oblique x-ray. And when you get the oblique x-ray, if the patient indeed has spondylolysis, which is to say they have a fracture in their pars interarticularis, it's going to reveal what's known as the Scotty Dog sign. And I'll show you what this looks like on the next slide. Now, Scotty Dog is actually very, very high yield because if you see an image on Comlex that's in the lumbar spine, there's a very high chance that that will be showing you Scotty Dog. Now, Scotty Dog, I'll just give you a little preview. This is what it looks like. On the left, you see the normal spine, and I've drawn in the red the borders of all of the different parts of the vertebrae. And on the right, you see spondylolysis, which is shown with a collar, so to speak, on the Scotty Dog. Now, in reality, that collar will appear dark, like a dark gray, almost black. But in order to highlight it in this image, I've shown it in yellow. Now, what do these borders of the Scotty Dog represent? Well, if we go back to our slide, the transverse process is the nose of the Scotty Dog. So you see that here, that transverse process is his nose. The pedicle of the vertebrae is the eye of the Scotty Dog. The pars interarticularis is the neck. And because that's what gets fractured in spondylolysis, it looks like the dog is wearing the collar, which again will be dark gray or black, but I'm showing it here in yellow just to really highlight where it would be in a radiograph of the lumbar spine. The superior articular facet represents the ear of the Scotty dog, and the inferior articular facet represents the front leg of the Scotty dog. So knowing your anatomy when you're looking at the radiograph is pretty important because obviously on Comlex or perhaps even on your in-class exam, they're not gonna highlight the borders of the Scotty dog in red like I've done on this slide. You would just have to look at the image of the lumbar spine and notice that there is that pars fracture, which will have the little collar on the dog but again, you're not gonna see these red and yellow lines. So again, the, the, the takeaway from this slide is that spondylolysis is a pars interarticularis fracture. The Scotty dog sign is going to be a little crack or a collar due to that pars fracture. So that's spondylolysis. So at this point, we've talked about the three terms that are a little confusing, spondylosis, spondylolisthesis, and spondylolysis. Again, those are the classic high yield terms that show up on Comlex in the OMT section pretty frequently. In the remainder of this video, I'm going to go through the other terms that you see on this slide to help you differentiate and work through your differential of low back pathology. Let's start with good old musculoskeletal strain. So not all injuries to the low back are organic bony related issues. Sometimes you can just have muscle involvement. Musculoskeletal strain refers to an overuse or traumatic injury causing muscular inflammation. So what you'll find is that there'll be a negative straight leg test. Now, what's a straight leg test? The straight leg test involves the patient lying on their back and the examiner keeping their back straight and their leg straight and slowly raising their leg into the air. If when you approach around 30 degrees, they have radicular pain, that would indicate to you that there's some type of nerve root impingement or nerve root involvement, which is usually suggestive, not always, but usually suggestive of a disc herniation at the very least. So because this is just a muscular injury and not an organic disc herniation, the straight leg test will be negative. Patients will have point tenderness. So because they have muscular inflammation, if you palpate the area of muscular inflammation, it's going to be ten tender. They may or may not have pain with motion that gets better with rest, again, because they're having inflammation in a muscle. If you move that muscle and contract that muscle, it's going to cause pain. 
The treatment for musculoskeletal strains is conservative, so NSAIDs, acetaminophen, and OMT, and very, very high yield to no, not just for musculoskeletal strain, but you can apply this to, to most of your low back pain pathology. You don't get an MRI unless there is nonspecific back pain, and that's been going on for about four to six weeks. So nonspecific back pain with no major red flags early on, you do not order an MRI. It is a waste of money. It is deemed on Comlex to be an unnecessary procedure. And the, the, you know, the big holistic idea, especially when we're talking about Comlex, is that you don't want to subject patients to um, diagnostics that are costly and unnecessary. So you don't get the MRI for four to six weeks if they're having this nonspecific low back pain with no red flags. That is musculoskeletal strain. Let's now move on to degenerative joint disease. So degenerative joint disease is really a general kind of umbrella term. It, it, it refers to things like osteoarthritis. It refers to things like spondylosis. It's just joints specific to the spine that degenerate. So your findings are going to be exactly what we talked about in spondylosis. You're going to get joint space narrowing, osteophytes, pain with motion that resolves with rest. Risk factors will be people that are obese or have excessive force placed on the spine, so manual laborers, etc. Treatment, unsurprisingly, because this is just degenerative spine, is going to be conservative at first. So NSAIDs, acetaminophen, and OMT. So I'm putting this here because you may see degenerative joint disease written on a test. You might see osteoarthritis. You might see spondylosis. These are really interchangeable terms for the purposes of low back pain. Now let's talk about lumbar disc herniation. Lumbar disc herniation refers to an intervertebral disc that protrudes or bulges through the annulus fibrosis. Findings are going to be a positive straight leg test. So I talked a few slides back about the straight leg test. You have the patient lie on the back keep their back straight, keep their leg straight, raise that leg slowly. And if at 30 degrees or beyond, they have pain that's ridiculous in nature, that means there's nerve root involvement, which is pretty suggestive that one of those lumbar intervertebral discs is herniated and pushing on a nerve root. Now, the most common site for lumbar disc herniation is at L5 S1, which will affect the S1 nerve root. The second most common area of lumbar disc herniation is the L4, L5 area pushing on the L5 nerve root. Now, the reason that these areas are the two most common has to do with two main things. One, the majority of the force that gets placed through the lumbar spine is directed at L5, S1 and L4, L5. Just the way that the biomechanics of our lumbar spine works, that area incurs the greatest burden of force. Now, the second thing is that you have, if you think back to anatomy, you have this ligament called the posterior longitudinal ligament. And that ligament sort of runs over the back or the posterior side of the lumbar spine. And what that ligament does in part is to protect the lumbar spine from having a disc herniation. But unfortunately, this posterior longitudinal ligament is weaker and has changes in its thickness or width when compared to the anterior longitudinal ligament. And because that posterior side is more susceptible to changes in width and changes in thickness, coupled with the sheer amount of force directed through that L5 S1 area, if there's going to be a lumbar disc herniation, it's going to occur posterior laterally through that posterior longitudinal ligament. So that anatomical relationship is very, very high yield. The diagnosis for a lumbar disc herniation is made with an MRI, and on the MRI, you'll just see it plainly, and you'll be able to diagnose it. The treatment is initially conservative, but if conservative measures don't work, then surgery is indicated. So that's lumbar disc herniation. Let's talk now about lumbar spinal stenosis. Lumbar spinal stenosis refers to a narrowing of either the central spinal canal, the lateral spinal recess, or the spinal intervertebral foramen, and in all of these cases, you're going to get spinal nerve impingement. So any one of these little anatomical areas or holes, if you will, as they get narrowed, they pinch nerves and cause spinal stenosis. So the very, very high yield finding of lumbar spinal stenosis is pain that's worse with extension of the spine, but better with flexion. And because of this, sometimes lumbar spinal stenosis is referred to in the vignette or in the question 
as the shopping cart injury or the shopping cart motion. So because patients prefer to flex their lumbar spine and in doing so open up those areas of spinal nerve impingement by flexing forward and bending and opening up those little impinged nerves, they look like they're pushing a shopping cart through a supermarket. So anything that the patient does that puts the spine into extension makes the pain worse. Anything the patient does that puts the spine into flexion makes the pain better. Again, this is just anatomical. You're opening or narrowing that spinal nerve impingement, which makes pain better or makes pain, pain worse. So it might not be as cut and dry in the question as patient looks like they're pushing a shopping cart. It might be, you know, patient prefers to bend forward to pick something up off the floor, pain gets better. Whereas the patient reaches backwards over their head and grabs something from the kitchen cabinet, pain gets worse. So just be able to infer, again, from the description, whether or not you have flexion or extension of the spine. The thing that you might see as well is a wide gait. Now that's it for the findings of lumbar spinal stenosis. Diagnosis is made with MRI. Treatment is initially conservative, so NSAIDs, acetaminophen, OMT. And if that doesn't work, patients can consider a steroid injection to help with that inflammation. That's lumbar spinal stenosis. Let's switch gears and talk about two emergencies, cauda equina syndrome and conus medullaris syndrome. Now I wanna pause for a second and and say that medical students historically have only memorized cauda equina syndrome, but in recent years, it's come to light that cauda equina syndrome and conus medullaris syndrome are actually two distinct low back pathologies that share a lot of overlapping features, but have some nuances to them and some minor differences. And because of those minor differences, they get tested all the time. Test writers know that med students don't want to memorize the differences, so this is becoming more and more high yield. For that purpose, I'm going to talk about cauda equina syndrome and conus medullaris syndrome on the same slide and point out the differences. So everything that has to do with cauda equina syndrome will be shown in red. Everything that has to do with conus medullaris syndrome will be shown in blue. Cauda equina syndrome will involve L3 and lower spinal segments, whereas conus medullaris syndrome will only involve usually T12 to L2. So conus medullaris is much more specific. Cauda equina is basically anything after L2, which we can say as L3 and lower. Cauda equina syndrome will have more severe radicular pain. Conus medullaris syndrome will have less severe radicular pain. Cauda equina syndrome will feature that classic saddle anesthesia that you're used to, you know, picking out of a test question and being like, bam, cauda equina syndrome. That's anesthesia of the inner thigh anus and genitalia. The reason for this is because cauda equina syndrome affects L3 and lower and generally S3 to S5 is responsible for the dermatomes around the inner thigh, anus, and genitalia. Saddle anesthesia is cauda equina whereas conus medullaris syndrome usually only features perianal numbness. Okay, so that's a big difference that I want to point out here. If you see full-blown saddle anesthesia, that should make you think more cauda equina syndrome. If you see just perianal numbness, that should make you think conus medullaris syndrome. For cauda equina syndrome, there's going to be pariasis of the legs, and it'll be asymmetric and hyporeflexic. But in conus medullaris syndrome, the pariasis will be symmetric and hyperreflexic. Okay, so these are two very big differences. One is asymmetric and hyporeflexic. The other is symmetric and hyperreflexic. Okay, so let's separate those mentally. You'll see erectile dysfunction, plus or minus, in both of these, but it's more common in conus medullaris syndrome and less common in cauda equina syndrome. You're going to have urinary involvement in both. What, what I want to point out is that for cauda equina syndrome, you do get urinary retention, but that, hap that happens later on because the onset of cauda equina syndrome tends to be more gradual. Whereas in conus medullaris syndrome, you get urinary and fecal incontinence early on and that happens early on because the onset of conus medullaris syndrome is sudden, okay? So I'm kind of grouping these differences together, urinary retention gradual and later, urinary and fecal incontinence early and sudden. And that's the difference between cauda equina and conus medullaris respectively. Now at the bottom here, you see this in purple because this is actually a shared overlapping thing for both cauda equina and conus medullaris. It doesn't matter which one it is, the answer is when it's when the question says what do you do next you get emergent surgical consultation 
Now, I know this is a lot of information, and again, I know that this is a very nuanced and detailed approach, but I'm doing this for completeness sake because it's high yield. Test writers know that these share a lot of similar but subtly different features, and for that reason, this is particularly high yield. Now, I do have one kind of stupid mnemonic to help you differentiate these, and the way that I remember this is the conus medullaris cone, right? The conus cone. And what does that cone help you remember? Well, what you'll notice is that the cone is 12 inches tall, which reminds you that it's T12 to L2 involvement. That circular portion of the bottom of the cone might remind you of the perianal numbness or the perianal region. And if you split that cone in half, you'll notice that it's symmetrical, right? Which is conus medullaris shows symmetric pariasis or symmetric and hyperreflexic. Whereas if we go back to cauda equina, it's asymmetric and hyporeflexic. So symmetrical cone, the cone is symmetrical. The cone has that round part at the bottom, which reminds me of perianal, perianal numbness. And I always make up that the cone is 12 inches tall. So it involves T12 to L2. The last part of this is I sort of imagine just suddenly getting poked by that sharp pointy part of the top of the cone, which reminds me of the sudden onset. And if you know that it's sudden, you can take that one step further and say that the urinary and fecal incontinence will occur early on because it's sudden onset, right? Sudden, you know, suddenly you just get poked with the top of this cone. Again, I know the mnemonic is stupid, but we're looking for free, easy points here. So if this is all your brain can handle, then perhaps you'll enjoy this mnemonic. So that's it for the difference between cauda equina syndrome and conus medullaris syndrome. The next part is perhaps the easiest to remember in this lesson. We're going to talk about referred pain. So not all low back pain is organically due to a low back etiology, right? Some of it can be due to peripheral or visceral causes. And I just want to run through those briefly. So a psoas spasm causes just kind of like midline general low back pain. Nephrolithiasis, remember that you're going to have that flank pain still in the back technically, but it's flank. Hip injuries will cause posterior lateral low back pain. Vascular claudication will involve the gluteal region and the legs, so it, it can be said to be low back and radiating downward. And then lastly, both pancreatitis and aortic dissection will feature back pain that is said to, to go straight through. So if you have back pain initially or subsequently in either of these conditions, it's not necessarily your low back that is the etiology, but it can be your pancreas or your aorta. So that was a run through of referred pain. And let's conclude this lesson by talking about ankylosing spondylitis. So ankylosing spondylitis is very, very high yield for Comlex because it has a lot of associations and a lot of small details you need to remember. Ankylosing spondylitis refers to a seronegative spondyloarthropathy that causes inflammatory, painful rigidity of the axial skeleton and spine. The findings are by far the highest yield part of ankylosing spondylitis. So you're going to see sacroiliitis. You could see displacement of the sacroiliac joints, which is referred to as Menel sign. There's a lot of associations with ankylosing spondylitis that can be in the, in the low back, but also outside of the low back. And because there's, there's this wide array of associations, it's, it's really, really high yield. So know that you can see anterior uveitis. You can also see enthesitis, which refers to inflammation of areas where bones and tendons will attach to one another. Dactylitis, restrictive pulmonary disease, and inflammatory bowel disease. So you see we're talking about the eye, the bowel, the lungs, the tendons, the fingers. There's a lot of extra articular manifestations or associations of ankylosing spondylitis. Remember that ankylosing spondylitis is associated with HLA B27. The really, really high yield clinical finding is that these patients will have morning stiffness or morning pain that improves with motion. So as they go throughout the day, the pain gets better because they're moving around. You could see bamboo spine, which is due to vertebral body fusion. But again, all of these findings are very, very high yield. So keep them in mind. The treatment for ankylosing spondylitis is indomethacin. Okay. Now that does it for this lesson. I ran through a lot of different low back pathology. I tried to differentiate and, and compare and contrast all of them, but all of this information you absolutely need to know for Comlex.